Well, amen. Good morning. And welcome to Celebration Community Church. We're happy and glad that you're here this morning. Let's stand up and we're going to offer this time unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord, especially this time of year. We just think um, of our neighbors and of our friends and our family, Father God, who's there for us. And Father God, it just reminds us how much you are there for us each and every day of our lives. Father God, helping us through the storms, helping us through life, helping us navigate um, this world, Lord. And we just appreciate your love. We appreciate your guidance and your mercy and your grace in our lives. And Father God, we come before you this morning and we just lift this time up to you. Lord, I pray that we would just forget about everything else that's going on today, this week. And Lord, my prayer this morning is that joy would fill this room this morning, Father God. Lord, that we would give our all to you this morning, that we would raise our voices to you, that we would clap our hands for you, that we would just have an attitude of worship and prayer here this morning. And we offer this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I've been there. 
Father God, there is nothing better than you. Thank you, Lord. The moon and stars, they were. The morning sun was there. The Savior of the world was falling. The body of the cross is blood for us. The weight of every person upon everybody. It's great to be here this morning. I'm glad uh, you'll all be able to have been able to make it this week and I um, uh, hope you're having a blessed week. 
Difficult trials, I know, but um, we go on. So, amen. I have a word this morning. It's entitled, This is the Way. My teaching came about as uh, my son Timothy and I were watching an episode of The Mandalorian on the, uh, on the Disney Channel. We like those sci-fi kind of things and um, part of the whole Star Wars saga. And um, the Mandalorians are a group of ancient warriors. And only a few of those have been left surviving. When they discuss, they come together, and there's, like I say, only a few of them left, and when they're discussing an issue and then they depart each other's company, they say, this is the way. Just very kind of plain, straightforward, no hand gestures, it's just, this is the way. And they have an understanding of what that means. Um, now, I'm not in, in uh, you know, in endorsing or promoting the Mandalorian, whatever, want everybody to watch or whatever, but... I just thought it was an interesting phrase. Now these warriors live by that creed, that this is the way statement means something to them. It's, it's a purpose, it's a plan, it's what we do, it's who we are. Kind of like the Marines, you know, the, the few, the proud, the Marines kind of thing, you know. Um, or Semper Fi. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's their... That's their their creed. A creed is a, a set of values, a set of, of um, beliefs that they're going to uphold, they're always going to do, because that's just who they are and what they do. And that creed is a system of beliefs that embraces as direction for themselves. They embrace that. They live that. I want to read a scripture from Isaiah 30, verse 21. Now, my wife reminded me of the scripture. I had totally forgot about this. But it says, And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. So, for us, it's the same thing as the Mandalorians. They have... It's not a... It's not a um, I don't want to cheapen it because it's not just a slogan. It's not just a motto. It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. And for us, the scripture encourages us here in Isaiah to walk in that. We have direction. We have biblical precepts. We have biblical direction. We have the Holy Spirit. And, and God quickens that to our heart. And he wants us to walk in that. Whether we go to the left, we go to right, basically wherever you're going, you need to live by the biblical precepts. And, you know, we're, we're not ignorant of those things. Many of us have been Christians for many years. We've read the Old Testament, the New Testament. We understand what God wants of us and expects of us. And if we don't know, we can go back and read it. It's right there in black and white for us. And if you're open to it, the Lord will quicken it to your heart. And, um, you know, Angel reminded me of something, too, that you know, it should be more than just, again, just a slogan. It's, it should be something where the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And we, we follow that direction. I mean, can, can you imagine being like Paul? Um, or the other disciples, when they would go to an area and the Holy Spirit would come and say, I want you to basically pick up and go. Or I want you to stay here until I return. Or there was some direction. But it's really no different for us. Those those original disciples, those apostles, were no different than you know our call today. We still have those same, you know, those same creed. We still have to follow those things, and it, and it benefits us if we do that. The purposes of God go forward, and if you if you won't do it, he'll just find somebody else that will, or you know, he'll have a donkey talk, or he'll have a rock cry out. It just he's gonna he's gonna get it done one way or the other, with or without us. So, you know, but you're blessed. The kingdom of God is blessed when you're obedient and you, you know, God says go and you go. And without, you know, so much questioning. As you mature in the Lord, that, that questioning should be less and less. You shouldn't be saying, well, no, God. You should say, okay, that's what he said. That's what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. 
And it's scary. It's scary to launch out like that and to venture into something new. You know, whatever he calls you to, whether it's talking to somebody in the, in the line at the supermarket or, you know, leaving your home and going to another country. It's, it's not always comfortable. It's not meant to be comfortable. It's meant to get us out of our comfort zones. And we, have, as Christians, have those tenets of faith. That's what I call them. They're tenets. They're principles. They're guiding directions. I want to read from Proverbs 4, verses 10 to 13. This is out of the NIV. It says, Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. There's a lot in there. God wants to instruct you. That's his desire. You know, he didn't just say, I'll figure it out, guys. I'll be back in a, you know, whenever. Just hang on until I get back. No, he gave us instructions. He sent the Holy Spirit specifically to guide us and teach us. He left his word written down for us. I mean, it, it couldn't be any easier. We don't have to translate it from Chinese or whatever. It's already been translated. We can just pick it up and read it all the time. But it's, it's an encouragement because he's saying, if you'll do this, you're going to live a long time. You're going to have a prosperous life. I'm not saying you're going to be a millionaire. When I say prosperity, I don't it's just mean money. You're going to prosper in the fact that you will have been obedient to God and you will have accomplished what the Lord has set you here for. That's your prosperity. Now, you, we expect you know, a pushback from the world. The world doesn't follow that. You can't expect any, but anything from unbelievers. You can't. You can't control their language, their actions, whatever. They're going to act the way they're going to act. So don't put that expectation that they're that you're act, you're supposed to you're, you're you're asking them to act like Christians. They're not. They don't know the Lord. There's been no redemption. There's been no salvation. There's been no healing. So they just act like they act. But we know better. I mean, it's hard to get Christians to act the right way and do the right things, let alone unbelievers. But the word encourages us to hold on to the instruction, don't let it go, guard it well, for it is your life. This is going to bless you to hear the words of God and to do those things. It's going to ultimately bless you. Even if it's not here, even if you get constant pushback from your family or friends or people around you or the world, they're not going to understand these principles. It doesn't make sense. The word says their eyes are blinded. They can't see that. It doesn't make sense. You're praying to somebody you can't see. It hardly makes sense to us half the time. But we do those things believing that God is true. And he confirms that. I mean, everybody in this room could probably raise their hand and say, They've seen a touch of God in their life in some way, somehow. Maybe many, many ways. But those things will bless you if you'll hold on to that. Now, what are some of the principles that we hold on to and guard? You know, these are tenets. These are statements of faith. And many churches have these written down. But these are pretty common. We believe that the Bible is the true, inspired Word of God. We believe it, the way it's written. We believe in one true God who's made up of three distinct parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus came to earth, lived among us, died for our sins, and was raised from the dead. We believe that you must be born again after repenting of your sin and accepting by faith Jesus as your Savior. We believe it is our responsibility to proclaim the gospel of Jesus throughout the world. Those are some of the basic tenets of our faith. There's more. There's more things you could probably go on for an hour. But those are the core 
coming to Jesus, repenting of your sin, accepting Him as the Savior, and knowing that you've been forgiven, and knowing that you have a place in heaven. Your name was written in a book now. It's not like Santa's naughty and nice kind of list. It's amazing when I talk to people at work or whatever or listen to other people. Think, they think that just by doing good. That's, that's karma. That's, that's a belief in karma. Like, we do good, we get good kind of thing, you know? And they think they can just, you know, do some good things and, you know, oh, I gave a donation at Christmas time to help some needy kids. That, that ought to get me in. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I hate to break it to you. It doesn't happen. You need to receive Jesus as Savior. There's only one way in. That's what the Word says. There's one way in. That's through Jesus' blood. Otherwise, you make a mockery of what Jesus did. It really does. If you think you can get your way in, then why did He go through that? Why did He suffer? Why did He die? Why did He come? He came to seek and save the lost. Isn't that what the Word says? So by receiving that blood, by receiving that forgiveness that only He can give, you honor the Father, you honor the Son, you honor the Holy Spirit, and your life gets changed. And then you're able to change other people. You're able to bring that same thing to them. And that's what it's meant to do. It's, meant to, it's a gift that's meant to be given away. It'd be like getting gifts on your birthday and you don't take them for yourself, you just give them to somebody else. Or Christmas time, you go into the tree and say, nah, you can have this one, you can have this one, you can have this one, I don't want anything. It's meant to be given away. That's our job. We have a responsibility to do that. And as the Mandalorian would say, this is the way. This is what we're supposed to be about. This is what we're supposed to be doing. We have been given a great privilege and a great responsibility to be a testimony for Jesus. In word and in deed, we should always be reflecting Jesus' light. That's our job. Remember, we aren't the light source, but rather just a, a mirror reflecting God's love. We just reflect what God has given. We're not the source. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Can you imagine if you were responsible for keeping this all together? I don't want that responsibility. It's already tough enough doing what i got to do. We just reflect. You know, when you see the light of the moon at night, it's just a reflection of the sun. The moon does not put off light of its own. 93 million miles away, there's a big ball of fire that keeps everything warm and lit. Now, you all know, let's see, it's my southern twang still in there. Y'all... Y'all know I'm a science geek. I've read articles and watched videos about the giant thermal solar array farms in the U.S. desert. It's actually in Nevada. It's called Ivanpah. It's in Ivanpah, Nevada. And out there, there is a giant um, array of mirrors, 140,000 to be exact, that reflect sunlight into a central tower that heats molten salt, that heats water, to turn a turbine to produce electricity. That's what it looks like. There's three towers out there. It's five square miles. You have to drive five miles in each direction just to get around the property. Amazing, amazing thing. All those mirrors, all those squares are just thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of mirrors around each tower. And they're all on computer-controlled pivots, and they follow the sun, and their job is to reflect that sunlight back to that central tower in the center. And it's literally, it's over a thousand degrees just from the sunlight reflecting. And they use a special salt that will melt and flows like a liquid when it's heated. And then it goes into big storage tanks. There's the center tower that's shining on it. It's so hot, if you pass in front of that, you would literally just fry. It actually, it actually harm, harms a lot of birds, because birds will fly by, and just the, the concentrated sunlight will, will burn them. Mm -hmm. 
But in God's kingdom, where are those mirrors? Where are the mirrors? Again, we don't produce the light. We reflect it. Jesus gives us something, and we shine that mirror back at somebody else. By living and sharing our lives and testimonies, we reflect Jesus' love to others around us. And again, that's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to be about doing. See, we get caught up in the day-to-day things. We think it's just about, you know, getting a job and, and taking care of your family and raising a family and blah, 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 blah. And I've asked people that question before. Why do you do what you do every day? Why do you do that? And they're like, well, we take care of our family. No, I said, you're you're missing the bigger point. Why do you do that? Why do you get up every morning and go to work and earn money? Why do you keep doing that over and over and over again? There's got to be a bigger purpose. There is a bigger purpose. Their bigger purpose and our bigger purpose is to shine the love of Jesus to everyone. To be that example that they can look at. You can be an example. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't follow somebody who's being a knucklehead and doing stupid things. But if they're acting like a Christian, if they're doing the right things, if they're providing the right example, if they're living their lives the right way, and they're following Scripture, they need to be an example that you can follow. You can say, hey, she's a good person. He's a great person. They're, they're, they're following the Lord. I, I want to I model that. I want to emulate that kind of a life. Because I see the blessing. I see it's the right thing to do. And we move to follow God's move. That's our purpose. You know, it's what, what Angel was sharing with me yesterday. You know, we need to have that urgency about following God. When he goes left, we go left. When he goes right, we go right. If he goes straight, we follow it straight. Because that's where the blessing is. That's where others get blessed too. And then we say to each other, this is the way. We have wisdom and understanding to follow God. We have that because we made a decision to follow Jesus. And he gives us that wisdom freely. You know, we don't just follow blindly. Because I think that's, that's a problem, that's a misconception, and I think the world misconceives it that way too. They think you just, you just follow this thing and you, you don't see it, you don't know it, you just, you just believe it. And why? And we have to have that convincing in our heart of why we do what we do. I want to read from Matthew 13. Verses 15 to 16, again, this is from the NIV. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they see, because they hear. You're blessed because you follow God. And you will continue to be blessed. Not for this life. This life is a short span. Your eternity is a very long span. You can't even think about that without probably popping a couple brain cells. How long is eternity? When is it? It it doesn't. That's incredible. Yeah, no clock. I'm such a clock watcher. I'm, you know, I got two cell phones I carry every day. I got a watch. Clocks all over the house. Every time daylight savings time comes, i got 14 clocks to change. We're so time conscious, but in, in eternity, there is, there's not those limitations. Yeah, you don't. You really don't. You're not going to be late for work because you don't have to go. We're able to understand God better because we chose to hear what he is saying and then act on what we have heard. So we get blessed by that. And choosing to hear God's voice is half the battle. The other 50% is working it out in your life. A lot of us can hear, but then when we go to the do part, 
that's where we kind of get hung up sometimes. Because it's not all, you know, nicey-nicey. It's hard. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes sacrifice. I want to read from Colossians 4, verses 5, from, 5 and 6. This is from the uh, ESV. It says, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious Season with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That's powerful. You know how to answer each person. That's individually. Don't give out the same pat answer all the time. If you ask the Holy Spirit when you're talking to somebody, especially an unbeliever, they'll give you, he will give you the wisdom to answer that person for what they need for that time. And you might not even know it. Half the time when we're hearing from the Holy Spirit, we don't even remember what we said. I used to do that at prayer meetings all the time. People would say, do you remember when you prayed for me? I'm like, no, I do not. Well, it changed my life. I'm, like, I'm glad it changed your life because I have no idea what I told you. I really don't. Sometimes I remember, but most of the time I don't. It's just the Holy Spirit... He inspires you to speak, and then they're, they're, like, they're like overwhelmed because it's like reading their notebooks. And that's a pretty cool thing when you can have that kind of impact in somebody's life. And, but only the Holy Spirit knows where they're at at that time. It might be different tomorrow. Or something you said today triggers a thought for tomorrow. But this passage specifically instructs us how to relate to unbelievers. And remember, you didn't create the salt. You know, we're supposed to be seasoned with salt. You didn't create the salt. God gives it to us as a gift. Just like that solar array tower we saw in the picture, the molten salt is used as a heat transfer medium. It didn't create the light. It just transfers the energy to the water to heat it and make steam. So the gift is from God, and we're a transfer medium. We use what God has given to us to bring to someone else. A transfer. We didn't, we didn't invent salt. So that keeps us humble, keeps us from being prideful. You didn't do this on your own doing. I want to finish up this morning, this last section, just speaking about thankfulness. And I think as we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, it's just appropriate time to thank God for the many blessings in our lives. Even though it's been a difficult year, we still have a lot to be grateful for. I mean, the difficulty doesn't really define the blessing. You know what I'm saying? Just because we struggle, we think, oh, well, we should have this, this rich blessing. The rich blessing, there's, there's things that happened that, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't manufacture her any other way. You know, you couldn't make happen. The pandemic forced us to come together as families. We got to do things that we never usually have time for, to be honest with you. And I've heard that from so many people. I've read it in so many articles. Reading Reader's Digest this morning in the bathroom. There was articles in there. You know, it's just like people sharing the blessings of what happened. And even though it was difficult and, and in some respects isolated for family, some of them got to, to either online or whatever be with family more than they would have normally. Maybe their job wasn't there. Maybe they couldn't go to their job and they're working from home. So now they get to see things that they never would see. But, I mean, so many people saying, you know, I got to see my, my daughter speak her first words or I got, you know, to do this or just wild stuff like that. So... Our mentality has to be to look for the blessings. 
to see what God has done and uh, appreciate, in spite of what happens, the gifts that God gives. And we can all be thankful for each other, that we have friends and family to lean on. Whether you have a big physical family or not, you have friends here. You have friends and people that love you and care about you and want to bless you and want to see you blessed. And we have those people to lean on because we all go through. I mean, I know Angel and I and in our family, we just we go back and forth. We kind of get bummed out, all this stuff going on and going to wear a mask everywhere you go and, you know, the craziness of the elections and all that stuff. And, you know, you start to get a little bummed out and then the other person says, hey, come on back. You know, take a break from the pity party and come on back. But we let, the, we let the circumstances override the blessing sometime. And we, we're looking at those, we're focusing on that. And that's not what God wants for us. I have a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. And this is in the ESV again. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. That in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech, and in all knowledge. Now, I'm personally grateful for the, the ways that, you know, God has blessed you and enriched your lives with grace. I mean, it's good to see people maturing. It's, see, it's good to see people growing up. And you bless me with your presence, too. Now, I'll be a little selfish. I like seeing you, everybody. You know, it's nice to have a family like that. I've shared this before, you know, we've been in churches where you were one of literally a thousand or two thousand people, and nobody knew your name. You could come in week after week, they were friendly and said hi, but there was no relationship, there was no thing. So this is a special group to be in a, in a family, really a family. It's not just a bunch of people that meet here, have some worship time here, a word, and, and head home, you know, we're, we're in each other's lives, and that's a great thing. You know, it, it brings joy and hope to the pastors, to all of us as pastors, to see you grow. There's, I think there's probably nothing f more heart-wrenching for a pastor than to see people struggling and people giving up on God or people walking away from God or whatever. That's, that's, that's a hard thing to see. But on the opposite side of that is it's a great joy to see you and uh, see the light bulbs come on. Like you say, oh, I get that. I get what that word means now. You might have read it 500 times, and then all of a sudden, one day, it just becomes real to you, and you grow, and then you're busy sharing that with everybody else. Oh, I, I, I got that word, and, and I applied that, and it changed my life. It'll change your life, too. So I encourage you to take time today to remember all the blessing that God has given to you. And remember also to bless those less fortunate than you. There's a lot of people hurting, especially now with all this stuff going on. They're just discouraged, and they're down. They don't even want to celebrate. They don't want to do anything anymore. And it's just like they've just thrown up their hands and given up and said, well, whatever. I think we can do better than whatever. And by you loving on somebody, it's going to change their life. It's going to rock their world. Because it restores hope. It restores the hope that God gives us. It speaks volumes. So I just encourage you to be as great a blessing as you can be. And remember, this is the way. I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great time, and just enjoy the love. Amen. Amen. Let's just end in prayer this morning. Father, I just thank you for your love and your faithfulness, Lord, to this generation, Lord God, to this group of people, to the world, Lord God. I thank you for the things that we can celebrate and we can find blessing in, Lord God, even in difficult times. 
Father, thank you for your love and your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you for all the provision you give us, Lord. And as we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, Lord, let it just be more than another day or another tradition, Lord. Let it be something that means something to, to everyone, Lord. Let us just connect with, with those who don't have much, Lord God. Let us connect with our families and our friends, Lord God. And we just thank you for all those blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.